look at how we can add value to uh, the health agenda. And this is just one of those initiatives that were taken forward that will surely be proven as good practice, um, again, leading the agenda as regards the prevention and protection way that we will we'll undertake in the future. And other fire and rescue authorities, I'm sure, will mirror and follow the, the, the fantastic work that, that we're going to start. Um, because we all know that the risk profile is changing and that we need to ensure that for ourselves, for our safety of our, for our staff and our firefighters, when they go into any properties, that they understand what the layout that the property is, what the, what the individuals, if there's any medical issues, if there's any canisters of any sort being uh, stored in the properties, uh, whether there's any sort of adaptations in the properties that's going to create a, an obstacle or a hazard for when our firefighters attend or have to go into a, a particular property. So all this information is going to be crucial as we go forward with our limited, uh, limited resources. So it is a good news story, and I hope that the media will sort of pick this up because we don't have many good news stories these days, do we? It's all seems to be bad, bad news after bad news. And the work that we undertake with the local authorities and all other partners in <coughs> identifying vulnerable people, because when you look at the statistics, it's, I think it's 75% 70, of people who died in a fire is over the age of 65. So that is quite concerning. So we need to make sure that we direct our resources appropriately and make sure that we have a positive impact on our communities. And again, thanks very much to everybody involved that, uh, you know, doing a fantastic job on behalf of the Emergency Time. With that, can I move the recommendation of the report? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, and item seven. Thanks, Chair. The purpose of this report is request that uh, members approve the, the safe uh, juvenile fire setting and dimension programme and the recommendation of the, 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 the juvenile fire setting approve the new juvenile fire setting programme. Um, members will see to the, the well, bare right hand side, we've got a number of pieces of, it, of equipment on the, the desk to the side, which you know, there's, there's a multitude of different things from little fire engines to maps of, of Merseyside and station boundaries and station areas. And that is the kind of the intervention program that we are now looking to achieve, <coughs> uh, which allows us to work with young people who have fire set and behaviour to share with them the kind of impact of some of the behaviours that they are exhibiting in their communities. So if they are repeatedly making coke scores or repeatedly setting fires, we would work with them to, to negate that risk for ourselves, particularly given the demand on our resources. Uh, now and in the future. Uh, and so the, we have previously had a FACE program, and this is just a revision of the FACE, FACE program into a new product, a new way of working, and a new way of interviewing with young people. What it also allows us to do is ensure we know where the boundaries for ourselves exist. So, what is fire play, how we can intervene, <coughs> but equally how we can move them onto other agencies who are potentially better places to deal with mental health related issues if they exist. So you know, the process will be fire rescue services intervene around education, but also identify the individual through what would be described as an early intervention, referral through um, the EHAP process, and potentially on to the child and adult licensed mental health services if, if required to do so as well. So it's sort of about our work with young people um, and education, but potentially on through the, 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 the kind of the care pathway for them. Um, so it's nothing more detailed than that, members. I'm happy to take any questions. So to say the, the products and the information is available on the table to your right hand side, should you wish to take a look at it. Um, but um, we just see the approval around the, the new approach, the removal of the page program and the reintroduction of the introduction of the same program. Okay, thanks. Any comments, questions? Uh, yes, uh, just to ask. Uh, are the schools and the, the defendant teams buying into this? Because un under the financial implications, they just say that um, <coughs> the one cost is 7000 and we will find that from the other internal budget lines. But I mean, if we're, if we're out there in the communities and we're working with young people, surely, and if we're getting referrals, is there a referral system that we're getting young people from? Um, certainly with, with the, the defending teams and, and young people are known to be us, it might not even be there, it could be younger siblings, so at a very much earlier age. So are the local authorities, so education, schools, and the us buying into this? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, I think it's a good question. 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 I think
Yet it seems to be now spoken to the particular English, so the local authorities are aware of the Canada, the offer that's available to them around him, that, that level of intervention, and that extends to the defendant teams. Do they buy into it necessarily financially? We haven't pursued that in that regard. You know, we recognize that as a fire and rescue authority. You know, being able to educate people around fire setting and fire setting players is probably you know, as pertinent to us as it is to any, any other part of the organization. The biggest and most key part of the whole intervention is the fact that we get them failed in the first instance. So they have an, a, an awareness of what we are able to provide, but equally we are able to work within certain parameters so we don't extend the work that we do outside of the work that you know, what skills that the individuals have because we are not child psychologists by any means and we need to kind of ensure that our, our staff appreciate that. They work with them on our interventions, they then are able to assess the, the individual's needs and move them on to other agencies and so it's a, a failed pathway which is both ways but a failed from the defendant team and our fire set behaviour, our intervention and then the discussion about where that individual is best placed. Now sometimes we may be able to intervene and that be, may be sufficient. On other occasions it may be that we have to refer them to another agency to help and support and then support through the whole process. But those networks, those referral pathways are, are now working uh, or so being able to be proposed that they are being discussed with them, but they are keen to pursue it in the same way that they are keen to pursue it. Yeah. I was just going to say, pretty much I think the opposite to Peter. I was going to say I thought the 7,000 was a very small amount of money. Yes. Um, because I think this is supportive and it dovetails greatly with the impact coming from the LAs. And I think in terms of additional social value for this early intervention, it'll be far in excess of that because it is really about changing behaviour very, very early on. And I think that is very reasonable amount of money, in my view. Safety and Welfare Performance of the Service is summarised at pages 238 to 239. You see that a total of 67 injuries were recorded during 2014-15, which is an increase of six on the previous year. The largest single injury type was injured whilst handling, lifting or carrying which in terms of actual uh, <coughs> in, uh, injury type is muscular strains. The second largest injury type was slips, trips and falls. Further analysis is provided in the appendix to the report, which is at pages 247 and 248. Members will note that whilst the number of injuries increased, the amount of duty days lost to those injuries reduced by over half compared to the previous year. The table at the bottom of page 238 <coughs> provides a breakdown of the injuries by activity type. Paragraph 2.2 on the associated table, which is at the top of the next page on 239, provides an analysis of injuries by age group. The intention is to identify if the increase in the normal pension age from 55 to 60 is having any impact on the numbers and types <coughs> that have been recorded in terms of the age group. A narrative on performance against objectives set for 2014-15 <coughs> in the tables 
on pages 240 through to 243. And the objectives for 2015-16 are listed within the tables on page 244 and 255. Two, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two, the conclusion to the report is provided on page 245. <coughs> One point to highlight, members, is the ongoing lack of near-miss reports that are being submitted, which is an issue that we've sought to address for a number of years. The simplistic <coughs> logic is that the, uh, the more near-misses that you have reported, the better chance you have of analysing the courses. So, for example, for, for 200 near-misses, there's one accident. So that, that's the, the idea is to, uh, really is to identify these things through near-misses rather actually than the <coughs> so be reassured that we will continue to uh, to encourage the this report. As I said previously, members, the report's been considered already in detail by the Performance and Scrutiny Committee. So it is submitted to you for note. That said, clearly I'm happy to <coughs> any questions that you might like have. The purpose of this report is to update members on matters of con uh, consultation and negotiation with the representative bodies following on from what was the final meeting of the consultation and negotiation committee which was held back on the 23rd of March. And you may recall that at the AGM you approved <coughs> the subsuming of the uh, industrial relations update onto the main or part of the agenda, hence this paper today. Uh, for members that did not sit on the Consultation and Negotiation Committee, this report is constructed in the same format as the report that was submitted to that committee. Paragraph 5 contains uh, details of 141 new or amended service instructions that are holding on consultation over the period, with a total of nine draft service instructions currently under consultation at the time of writing the report. <coughs> Comprehensive update on the implementation <coughs> of the 24-hour whole time retaining duty system beyond Croxton Fire Station is provided within paragraph 6 through 14 on pages 264 and 265. In so many members, the 24-hour whole time retaining duty system is now in operation <coughs> at St Helens, Highton, Bromborough and Upton Fire Stations. Paragraphs 15 to 26 on pages 265 to 269 provide details of the memorandum of understanding that's been uh, reached with the Fire Brigade Union and also a copy of which is provided in Appendix C of the <coughs> It's uh, an important point for me to make, members, that this MOU represents an excellent piece of work between the FBU and officers and is indicative of the very good industrial relations that we now enjoy on Merseyside. <coughs> the MOU represents a very solid platform on which for us to predicate our operational response model and places us in the best possible position to deal with the further cuts to our budget that were announced earlier on this afternoon in the local government finance settlement. That is something, members, that I'm very proud of, and you all should be as well. Another area of real progress, which I'm also very proud of, is reaching agreement with the FBU over a co-respondent trial, or emergency medical response, as is noted in your report. Members may be aware that co-responding involves firefighters responding to incidents of cardiac arrest, alongside the ambulance service. <coughs> the update on the Merseyside Correspondent Trial is provided in paragraphs 27 through 38 on pages 269 to 271. So many members of the trial are set to commence on the 4th of January, initially from Southport, Speak, Wallasey, Croxteth, followed thereafter by Aintree, Birkenhead, 
Crosby, Toxter and Old Swan prior to the full rollout across the service at the point at which all of our staff, or the, the overwhelming majority, are trained and in date on their first place <coughs> on the uh, medical response qualification. To reassure members, the responses under this scheme will be limited to cardiac arrest calls only. It should not amount to any more than an additional two to three mobilizations <coughs> per appliance per week. But I would make the point, members, that these are lifeless incidents and we are responding to them to enhance the safe system of work that North West Ambulance Service are required to provide at these incidents. So we are providing additional pairs of hands for activities such as CPR, so basic life support. Clearly, if we arrive at an incident first, then we are trained and will apply and have applied automatic uh, external defibrillation in addition to the CPR. The MOU reached with North West Ambulance Service has the full support of the FBU <coughs> and all of the ambulance service unions. It has been identified regionally as the most suitable mechanism by which to further this concept beyond the trial. In closing, members, I would like to place on the record my thanks to the FBU for the very pragmatic and supportive approach that they've adopted working towards this outcome. This is another example of what can be achieved through good industrial relations, which is especially important as we now face what I believe <coughs> to be the most extreme challenges that we ever have as a service. Pause at that point, members, to take any questions that you may have. Thanks, Jen. I'd just like to um, endorse the Chief's uh, comments um, regarding the industrial relations with the FBU um, and in general the, the things that are going on. I mean, I have been dealt with the FBU on health and safety issues and seeing that the cooperation on that side of it with, with the officers. And this has been extended on this report as well. And it's a pleasure to, to be part of a, an organisation where industrial relations is, is paramount. <coughs> And obviously, we're not playing with people's lives, we're playing with you know, the mechanics of people's lives. And I think, I, I think we should be not as members of support on that. Thanks. Can I have any other thoughts? Yeah, just to, um, as a member of the consultation and negotiation committee, um, I'd just like to say well done to everybody. I know it's been said, when we said we were going over to just reporting to full authority, I did have any concern, but I would like to say to all the rep bodies, and to Nick Murnock, well done, you've done a cracking job, you've all the three additional hours, the, the corresponding trial, I never ever thought we'd see that through, so well done, and as far as I can make out, I can see that that's Merseyside fire, we take some stick by not having retained firefighters here, but we stand by everything, because we lead the way, we lead the way, and that's the way it should stay. I'd just like to say, let's share the authority of how I am proud I am about the, the underway, the industrial relations are at the moment and have continued to improve over the last few years or more and longer that continues. It's important that we have that dialogue with all our rep bodies because of the challenging times that we face. I think it's important to have that open and transparent discussion on the cards on the table so we know exactly where we are, what we have to deal with and how we best
the exciting engagements today uh, about the weeks back. It just goes to show how beneficial it was to have that dialogue with all elements of the organisation, just in the first hand, uh, from those individuals who attended. That was very constructive, very positive, and you know, it made us very, very proud to be involved with such a great organisation such as the Fire and Rescue Service. So again, thank you very much for all your everybody's involvement and constructive uh, dialogue over the last 12 months or so. On that, can I move that the recommendation of the report be agreed? Agreed, John. Item 10 is the East End of Shorts. And sir, the purpose of this report is to require the past members approve the statement of assurance for 2014-15. As members will be aware, the Fire Rescue Service National Framework sets a requirement on the own policy to publish an annual statement of assurance. The text, uh, paragraph 3 on page 291 of your report, is a direct lift from the framework, so that's the, that's the direct narrative that's involved in italics in, in your report. The statement of assurance is attached to the report in Appendix A, which is at pages 295 to 312. Contents uh, of the self, uh, sorry, the statement of assurance rather than self explanatory. The only additional point to make, members, is that the statement of assurance is backward looking. <coughs> this would only contains details which appertain to the period 1st of April 2014 to the 31st of March 2015. So it does not, for example, <coughs> reference our response to the Bosley Wood Flower Mill. Uh, incident in Cheshire, or indeed our more, more recent response to the flooding in Cumbria. Uh, conscious members that today has been uh, quite a long day for you here, I know you've been in quite early uh, from this morning, so I'll, I'll, I'll pause at that point if I can take any questions that you want to have. Any questions or points? No question, <coughs> excuse me, no questions here, but I, I don't think we're going to let today go well on. So, uh, Thanks to, to the chief and his officers and everybody to go to come here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, you know, we know, I think we've all known people around the area, and I was talking to a few of them, and they actually met up with some, some of the lads who were down there, and, 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 and they were saying not only were they, were they absolutely fantastic at their job, he said the normal things that they've done with a really good sense of humour. Yeah. Uh, they said they, 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 yeah. they were in so much in joy, and they said, but they, they just made people feel a great deal better than just helping them. And he said it was, it was uplifting, and they, and they asked us, they asked me to, to pass on the thanks. He said, because they're an absolutely brilliant job, and, and they, just, they just can't say enough for the, uh, for the officers. And he said, on many occasions, like he said, some of the officers were putting themselves at risk as well, um, not only of their own lives, but for their safety. So again, I think we should pass on our thanks, as we've always done, and to continue, and it should come from this committee. Because they do a great job. Wherever they're asked to go, you go. And we're talking about worldwide now, not just, <coughs> not just your own. So it's about time we get. And I know it doesn't, doesn't need us to tell you to keep blowing the trumpet for them, but I think we, we, we minute it as often as we can to say thank you to them and we tell them that we should do so. Well, 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 well. Thanks. Thanks for that, um, I, I think, uh, I think the, message, the message should go out to a lot of staff in the gates with the audience uh, because, you know, the government say about the, the impact of doesn't the, you know, cuts on the services. This is going to be a stretch for us, and you know we're in the early stages of we're not even to winter as yet, so we can only see this reoccur time and time again as we go on over the next couple of months. And I'm sure you know our staff, our very highly professionally trained staff, will be called upon on many occasions to go assist in other areas across the country. And I'm sure that the government and civil servants will be made fully aware of that. Okay. Thanks, Chair. This report is the second financial review report, 2015, and comes to be April to September 2015. As per paragraph 5 on page 315, the report covers the confirmation of the final accounts outside position, 2015, the review of the current year's budget and spending position, Treasury management updates, internal audit progress statements, 
and an update on the performance of the financial processes. Grant Thornton reported to the Housing <coughs> Business Committee in September that audit findings followed in order to the 2014-15 final accounts. As per paragraph 6 and 7 of this report, the previously reported outstanding position for 1450 remains unchanged, and therefore the 1,287,000 uh, underspend after taking account of plan reserves has been confirmed. Paragraph 11 and table A on page 360 informs members that all of the 2015-16 approved revenue <coughs> saving options have now been implemented. After taking into account actual spend up to September, a forecast 0.8 million or 1% underspend <coughs> is anticipated on the revenue budget. Paragraph 12 and Table B on pages 317 to 318 outlines the revenue forecast position. The favourable outer position is mainly due to employee savings as a result of firefighter retirement being slightly higher <coughs> and savings on the price inflation provision. Changes to the approved five-year capital programme are outlined <coughs> on paragraph 13 to 15. Overall, the programme has increased by 2.2 million following members approval of the updated costs for the new Prescott fire station. <coughs> These increased costs are being funded by reserves and external contributions. The level of overall borrowing has remained relatively unchanged. Paragraph 16 to 17 on page 319 <coughs> is that, uh, just over £4 million of reserves have been drawn down to meet the cost of approved schemes in 15-16. And members agree that the capital investment is increased by £0.8 million funded by the forecast favourable revenue position identified in this report. Treasury management strategy remains consistent with the approved strategy as outlined in paragraphs 18 through to 23 pages 320 to 322. Investments stood at 39.4 million as of the 25th of September. However, of this 24.8 million relates to the firefighters pension grant that is needed to provide <coughs> firefighter pension payments in 2015-16. As stated, stated in paragraph 24, some of the internal audit reviews have commenced in course to but have not yet been completed. The majority of us will be carried out in the last quarter of the year to tie up the year-end system checks. And finally, as outlined in paragraph 25 to 32, financial processes performance remains strong. Members are asked to approve utilisation of the <coughs> 10 million favourable variants to increase the capital investment reserve in light of the future station merger programme and service investment needs. I'm happy to take any questions, but I thought it might be worth pausing at this point as we talk about the financial settlement. Um, before I came down to the meeting, we haven't yet seen, received any formal notification of what our future grant figures will be. However, I've managed to get some indicative figures, but I put the caveat that these have yet to be confirmed. Members will recall that we have assumed that we may be facing a £14 million <coughs> challenge by the end of 1920. Based on those indicative figures, it might be lower than that, £11 million, but £11 million is still a big challenge to deliver by 1920. What I propose to do as soon as today's meeting's over, hopefully we'll have those figures confirmed, and then I'll send members out if that's an agreement what those figures are and what the challenge might, might be going forward. So I just wanted to raise that. It wasn't on the report. We're still waiting for the figures to be confirmed, but I want to talk to you. I don't know if Dan's got anything he wants to add on that before I take any questions. Just before we do, just some procedural matters. Um, we need to ensure that if, if there's any questions or comments on the financial report, okay, so it results to September, and then we approve the recommendations within the report, mm -hmm. and then allow a verbal update on the information that's only just been received. So are we, are we okay with that yeah. process? Agreed. Yeah, just for the minutes and
as as Ian has said, it <coughs> would normally happen is the I and the treasurer would receive a, uh, a formal letter from DC, an email from DCLG, which would contain the, the detail um, related to our specific settlement. So the figures that Ian has spoken to previously are ones that he has managed to extrapolate out of a, uh, of a, of a spreadsheet which gives the overall figures for all authorities. So no reason to doubt that they're not accurate, but I just need to caveat the fact that we haven't yet. We may well have, we, it may have come in whilst we've been in this meeting, but at the, at the beginning of this meeting we didn't, we hadn't yet formally received the, the notification, as I say, that would come to me and to me as the treasurer. We have a, uh, a strategy day in January. The agenda for the strategy day uh, will be uh, made uh, will be made available to you soon. If uh, in fact, I think that's an odd come out internally. I'm not sure if uh, the members have had a copy of that yet. But if you haven't, certainly you will get that very soon. And we will use that strategy day to firstly give you the, the detail because Ian you know, have done the, the analysis at that point. And then I will uh, I, I will explain to you what that is like. <coughs> As it stands, we'd modelled a range of scenarios. We had assumed the worst case outcome being a forty million pound savings target by nineteen twenty if figures are accurate and we've no reason to think that they won't be. That is a, an 11 million target. But be under no illusions, members, any further cuts to our budget from where we are now are going to result in us having to make some very, very difficult decisions indeed. There is no prospect that we will deliver 11 million pounds of savings from non-fire uh, non station related uh, budget lines. It just is not going to happen. So this is the result in further fire losses of fire, fire, fire engines, but as opposed to clearing fire engines and therefore fire stations. Right? So what I've spoken to previously, like that is going to come to fruition. You know, that there is, unless there is a referendum for, unless members approve a referendum, and in order to make up that type of deficit on council tax precept, you would be looking at a huge huge percentage increase that would be on for on a referendum or unless some miracle occurs between now and there uh, and when this is formalised which will be at some point after Christmas then you know, the position I am not can't overstate this members this is a uh, this uh, whether it's fourteen million or eleven million quite frankly is academic in one sense it is a huge, huge challenge. I pause at that point here yeah, because I really think this is uh, not a great deal more for me to say. I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's typical of the way the government's uh, handling the, the, the cuts to local governments, and particularly the fire service. Because when you think about it, these announcements should be made a couple of weeks back, and it's like the information is just being driven in, and then you've got to try and decipher yeah. the information yeah. talking somewhere along the line. And although we've got some early indication of what it might be, or what it might look at, that is yet to be confirmed. It also has still to be confirmed whether there's going to be an in-year cut or whether it's going to be a financial plan for the next uh, four years in line with the parliamentary uh, year. So that could be subject to change. But any further cuts that we have to implement as regards to the Mersey side, when you think on the back of the £26.5 million pound cut that we've had to implement over the last four to five years and the effect that that's had on the service, Imagine now any further <coughs> right into our core business. It's going to affect our delivery of service and it's going to affect the yeah, that's going to impact the safety of our communities. And if we don't let people aware and politicians, the senior politicians are aware of the impact that these courts are going to have to an emergency service. I might say that we're the only emergency service that has not been protected in this mass spend review which is absolutely unfortunate, absolutely disgraceful. On the back of everything that's gone on, with the latest terrorist threats, mm -hmm. and everything that we should be doing to ensure yeah. that we protect our communities, and we're at a, a, a threat level of severe, 
So the, it's, we think that that attack can happen at any moment. We have to ensure that our emergency services are ready and have the ability to respond to any emergency. And what the government is doing, they're cutting the legs from under us. And, you know, you know so far well, if anything you know, just went or something happens, our staff will be expected to be running in there first while anybody's running the other way. And it's absolutely appalling the way this government has dealt with the fire and rescue service. Absolutely appalling. So once we know the final detail, we'll send that out to all members. <coughs> And we'll also be sending that out to obviously the leaders of all the local authorities and also to our members of parliament to ensure that they ask questions in the House of Commons and challenge the government on, on the spending review. Because we can't just sit back and accept this. And I, I know full well that obviously all our trade union colleagues will be doing exactly the same. Every opportunity that we have to raise the questions that this government have never ever done a full risk assessment or evaluation of the impact that the cuts have had to the fire and rescue service to date, and yet the cut has even further. It's absolutely appalling on this bill. But I won't go on, because I don't want to get too close. Um, but does any other members have any comments? Just one quick one, that maybe we should suggest that the comprehensive spending review be, be changed in our public tech, which is comprehensive spending cuts. Because I don't know if you always think that may go up, but you know where it's going to go. And secondly, whether you've done the by accident or not, Dan, you sure that's not what you're looking for the future? There's only six of them. <laughs> Just to reassure the uh, councillor, God, it is my intention to maintain real fire appliances. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of the number. <laughs> but uh, we've got the budget uh, strategy day in January, <laughs> and obviously we'll have opportunities to go through and look at what options are available to, to, to ourselves, to the service. Uh, and then the budget meeting is at the end of February. Um, so over the next, obviously, once we get everything confirmed, uh, send information out to members, um, have some dialogue with our representative bodies and our staff. Um, again, I always say when we've been to uh, briefings of staff, if there's any suggestions or any ideas that you think that we have a look at, let us know, because we may not have all the answers. So, you know, what are <coughs> Members, elected members of the authority, is we try our best to protect what we can. Not only for staff wise, but also for the service that we deliver to the public and the So we've got a difficult job ahead of us. Dan, as the chief and other senior officers, have got a very difficult job going through the Northern Country and seeing what, what we can achieve without affecting our, our service. But you know, at the end of the day, it's the, 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 the low hanging fruit has gone. And now we're not picking away at everything. Service as an emergency service. It's, you know, it really is a question. Okay, are we happy with that? Yeah, yeah. 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 The Chief Fire Officer early on um, mentioned the good industrial relations and, and that is the only thing that we can see will get us through this at the moment. Um, and our commitment is the same as it was when we very, very first went into these cuts <coughs> it became apparent how severe they were going to be. Our commitment has always been to the public of Merseyside and we haven't wavered from that one, one moment right throughout this and that commitment is there going forward up to 2020 that the public of Merseyside will come first in every single thing that we do as the fire brigade union. That's all I'm saying, actually. Until we get the, the full breakdown of the cuts, it's, you know, we're coming to the point of commenting on what we can't see at the moment, so. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, on that turn, there will be part. Thank you. Okay. Item 12 now is uh, exempt items, so we'll have to exclude all the press now.